I was terrified of speaking in public when I was in high school. I avoided any class that would require it, and, and in college. And then I finally signed up for a Dale Carnegie course. Uh, when I got out of school, I realized I had to talk to people, and I spent a hundred bucks. I got this little diploma. I proposed to my wife during the uh, during the uh, uh, term of the course, so I really got my money's worth there. But in terms of public speaking, I really had to force myself on that. In terms of talking privately, they couldn't stop me from the moment I started I <laughs> in school. I think I, I've always I, I've always liked to talk. How do you keep up with all the media and information? that goes on in our crazy world and in your world of Berkshire Hathaway. What's your media routine? I just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of, of magazines. I read 10Ks. I read annual reports. And I read a lot of other things, too. So I, I, I've always enjoyed reading. I love reading biographies, for example. And you process information very quickly. Well, I have, I have some filters in my mind. So if, if somebody calls me about an investment in a business or an investment in securities, I usually know in two or three minutes uh, whether I have an interest. And I don't, I don't waste any time with the ones I don't, in which I don't have an interest. When I think about your world, 330,000 people who are employees of Berkshire Hathaway or its subsidiaries, how do you send a message that they are being scrutinized under the microscope by the media at all times? Well, I send a message to their managers. I, the, those 330,000 people work for maybe 70 or so CEOs and in turn work for me. So I, I, my job is to have those 70, 70 CEOs sending out the right message. So every two years, I write them a very simple letter. It's a page and a half. I don't believe in 200 page manuals because if you put out a 200 page manual, everybody's looking for, uh, for loopholes basically. But page and a half, it's very hard for them to <laughs> argue about what I'm talking about. So I tell them, uh, you know, that my reputation, Berkshire's reputation is in their hands. And not only, and we've got all the money we need. We'd like to make more money, but we've got all the money we need. We don't have an, uh, an ounce of reputation beyond what we need, and we can't afford to lose it. So we never will trade reputation away for money. And, and they're the ones that are the guardians of that, and that uh, I want them to not only do what's legal, obviously, but I want them to judge every action by how it would appear on the front page of their local paper written by a a smart but semi-unfriendly reporter, you know, who really understood it, to be read by their family, their neighbors, their friends, and it, it has to pass that test as well. And I tell them I don't want anything around the lines. I tell them there's plenty of money to be made in the center of the court, and I'm 84 and my eyes aren't that good anymore. I can't quite see the lines that well. So just keep it in the center of the court, and if they have any questions, call me, you know. What advice do you have for a CEO who's on the media hot seat because of a similar situation? Well, there's, there's a couple pieces of advice on that. Uh, the first is that when you find out a bad, bad news, correct it, and if it's necessary to report it, then the authorities report it immediately. The big problem with Solomon was not what a fellow named Mosier did, which was to defy the U.S. government, not ever a very good idea, but that could have been handled. But he reported, it, it, he didn't report it. John Merriweather, his supervisor, uh, picked up on it in late April of 1991 and went to the president and the chairman and the chief legal counsel of, of Solomon and said, here's what this fellow Mosier's been doing. And they all agreed it was wrong. They all agreed it was reportable to the Federal Reserve promptly. And unfortunately, nobody did anything. And then in the middle of May, Mosier went out and did it again. And now you've got a terrible problem because you knew a, the guy was a bad actor uh, a few weeks earlier, and you hadn't reported it, and now that compounded there, and then you're in a, you're in a real pickle. So when you, when you find bad news, you know, my, I say get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over. And get it right is important. There wasn't any question that Mosher had done it there, but the get it fast and get it out, they, they missed on. And so deal with bad, you're going to get bad news. I mean, I got 330,000 people. I mean, I, I will guarantee you that probably dozens of them are doing something wrong right now, and I just hope I find out about it early and the person below me finds out and lets me know if it's bad enough and that they stop it. So you can't have a city of 330,000 without an occasional <laughs> crime of some sort. Uh, so it's going to happen, and you've got to do something about it fast uh, when it does happen. The biggest sin in journalism that I see, and I, I think, incidentally, I think I probably, as a CEO, have spent more time talking to journalists than perhaps any CEO in the country. Partly that's because I'm 84, but partly because I like to talk to journalists too. But 
the, the greatest sin they commit, you, you've got to start a story with a hypothesis. I mean, you're looking into something because you have a working hypothesis, but you have to give up that hypothesis if it turns out not to be correct or if, it, or if it's misleading in a major way. So uh, I always worry about the journalist that calls me. They've decided what story they're working on, and all they're looking for is confirmatory evidence. So I call it quote shopping. They'll talk to me for 45 minutes hoping they get one quote that confirms their story and ignoring the other 43 minutes when I tell them things that should limit the, the story. So it's, it's very natural. You know, you get time invested in it, you've got this working hypothesis, and once you've invested a lot of hours and your editor knows you've invested a lot of hours, maybe it was the editor's working hypothesis to start with, now, now, you're, now you've got to go back and tell him he's wrong or her. I mean, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of momentum uh, toward a bad story. There's a lot of momentum toward a good story, too, but, but you, have to, you, have to, you have to be able as a writer to say, my hypothesis is no longer correct. And all it was was a hypothesis. That's no sin to say that, but it's hard to do. My first diversity training in GE was in the mid-'80s. So I'm in almost my 30th year of being trained how to run a meritocracy, how to be uh, open, how to encourage an open workplace. There's no excuse of, for people of my generation not to be open to no matter where you came from, no matter what you've done. If you can bring it, if, you're, if you've got merit, if you're winning, you're going to get promoted. Looking back when you became CEO in 2001, what have been the most unexpected hurdles? So, you know, Jeff, it, it's funny, I, it's been almost 14 years to the day, and we had the anniversary of 9-11 last week, uh, you know, so it always makes me thoughtful. I think the world, if I had to pick one, you know, we'd come out of this time period of really geopolitical peacefulness, U.S. was the center of the economic world, we really hadn't seen a meaningful recession since 1990 and things like that, so I think the biggest surprise has just been the world has just been twisted from one of relative, I would say, you know, benign growth to one of just high volatility, high geopolitical risk, things like that. And so in many ways, the environment today is nothing like what it was, like what I thought it would be when I became CEO. We want to stay relevant today. The second thing I'd say is I'm, I'm blown away by companies like Google. You know, I, you know Google's, I think, 12 years old. I am completely impressed with what they've done in 12 years. But the third thing I'd say is, look, we matter. You know, in other words, we're not, we're not going away. We're paranoid. We're investing. We're changing. We're relevant to our customers and the industries that we serve in. So I, I, I always think these, you know, we don't want to be Microsoft. We don't want to be Google. But we're inspired by them. We're, we, 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 we want to be better because of them. Look, I've done this now uh, 14 years. It's a hard job. You know, in other words, anybody that sits there and says they think these jobs are easy, these are hard jobs. You have to learn every day. I, I think, I think what's, uh, what I love about our company and what I try to match myself is just resiliency. The, this, this sense that we're never as good as we want to be. We're, we're never as good as we can be and that no matter what happens, we can keep getting better. So I, I, think, I think what I would say we've accomplished is we've done all these changes in a very unforgiving, with almost no tailwind, right? So we've been able to change the portfolio, grow earnings, do things like that, and have had three recessions, uh, you know, political unrest and, 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 uh, and things like that. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was having, uh, lunch today with a, a political candidate, somebody that's running for president. And, you know, we don't really, we don't think today as a company about government doing tax reform or immigration reform or, or great things. We, we are more worried about the government shutting down in mm -hmm. two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's something that my predecessors didn't have to grapple with, right, in terms of where the world is. So in a very volatile world, we've stayed focused on you know, kind of what we thought we could be, accountable to, you know, our customers, our investors, and each other. And, and I think that's made us a better company. We've got great creative people that work for GE, and we turn them loose on, on social media and, and allow them to 
create their own uh, stories. One of the things I reviewed this morning is on uh, National Geographic Channel, uh, Ron Howard and Brian Glazer are doing a six episode uh, story of technology and science that has world class directors from Hollywood who are producing shows on the brain, the future of energy, and GE scientists are a part of that. So I think we're into the, the, the things that interest people and, and we're willing to experiment in new ways of storytelling uh, with the talent that we have inside the company. And I think that combination, I don't know if it makes us cool. My, I have a 28-year-old daughter. She might disagree with the notion that I could ever be cool. But it makes us relevant, which is probably even more important. When you're in a country like Indonesia, how much do you have to think about profit versus how much do you have to think about the indigenous peoples and where do you draw the line? It's not a line, Jeff. It is really not a line because we can't create value for our shareholders unless we operate ethically and that means complying with laws in the countries where we operate and as well as laws like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the U.S. Securities Laws. And if we are not responsible to the environment or the local people or the governments where we operate or our workforce, we ultimately can't make profits. And so it, it is not a question of A or B. To B, to create shareholder value in our business, we have to act responsibly. How do you manage through a foreign government to do the right thing? You know, we have this uh, transition in the undeveloped world that we were going through. Um, you probably can put a pinpoint at about 1960 when colonialism started dying out. And co countries were formed many of them ended up being ruled by authoritarian governments, dictators and so forth. Uh, and now there's this transition of those types of governments to democracies. And in many places you find immature democracies. Uh, different countries have different views about ethical issues than we do, particularly about uh, what we call corruption here, you know, government officials participating in business. Uh, and so our challenge is uh, we, can't, uh, we can't go through a strategic analysis and say we want to operate in a particular company, country because that's a good country to operate in. We have to go find resources and go where those resources are and see if we can enter into a relationship with a host government virtually everywhere in the world outside the United States, governments own the resources. You know, here in the U.S., government owns certain resources, but private property owners own resources. And so to get the rights to operate, we have to negotiate arrangements with central governments. And then we're located, as you pointed out, often in places where there are indigenous people and often the relationships between the central government and indigenous people are, 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 are strained. And what we've learned is that while we have to adhere to the laws and the terms of our arrangements with host governments, we can't turn a blind eye to the local communities. The current stoppage is a relatively small group of Papuan workers who actually are protesting the fact that management didn't penalize some earlier strikers that we had last fall. And so they, they're protesting the actions of certain other parts of the workforce and the fact that we didn't discipline more, more aggressively. This is, uh, I, I wish we had time, this is a fantastic, fantastically difficult social structure there in Papua to deal with, where you have 
indigenous people and different tribes. On, on the island of New Guinea, there may be six and a half, seven million people in the total island, and they speak 25% of the world's languages. People that are racially different from the rest of Indonesia, they're almost all Christians, fervent Christians. I grew up in the Bible Belt, and they, you know, they are dyed in the wool Christians in a country that's 85% Muslim. You know, it's a liberal form of Islam in Indonesia. But because of the racial differences, the religious differences, the tribal differences, it really, and we're right in the middle of it, it makes life real complicated to operate. And did the work for a company called Computer Science then. A friend of mine was the managing partner, and as I left, I went and spoke to him. And I said to him, uh, I just met this individual and worked with her, and, and this is the smartest person I've met at this firm. Why is she a manager and not a partner? And he looked at me and said, a woman partner? We don't have any women partners at our firm. So America, the secret sauce for 100 years, was the best and brightest women, whose job opportunities were somewhat restricted to nurse or teacher. Once they were emancipated and the opportunities came, and today, <clears throat> the CEO of our largest car company and the CEO of our largest defense company and the CEO of IBM are all women. The country needed to recalibrate and think, okay, the people that have educated this country for 100 years are best and brightest. Many of them might be moving to other fields now as opportunities are open to them. And we're going to have to reevaluate the compensation structure and incentive structure in our educational system to deal with the fact that we're not competing with whether they're going to be a nurse or a teacher, but whether they're going to be the CEO of IBM or not. And the country, even today, has not fully adjusted to that change. In the late 1980s, I visited with a really brave man named Gorbachev at the Russian Embassy in the United States in D.C. And he had with him his equivalent to our Commerce Secretary. And he told me they want to get into venture capital. They want to get into small and medium businesses. They understand that they create all the jobs and they want to find a way to make that happen. And they have a, a very strong science commitment in the Soviet Union. So I told him, I, I, you need to understand if you're going to get involved with venture capital, not later financing, but to start new businesses, it's quite possible seven of the ten will fail. And then the Commerce Secretary, Commissar, said to me, do you put the people in jail then, okay, of those seven out of ten that fail? I said, no. We assume they've learned something from the experience, and they will be better the next time. So, and then I told him, I don't think you're quite ready for venture capital. But if America at that time had an enemy, it probably would have been considered to be Gorbachev. He, it was Gorbachev that he admonished to tear down that wall. We spoke with President Gorbachev not long ago, and he said that President Reagan was a great man. So here's as big an opponent as you could get, saying about his opponent, he was a great man. When you think today about can you work on the opposite side of things and in the end have the respect and admiration of the person who you sat across from in, a, in uh, opposing views. And I think that's the kind of gentleman that President Reagan was. He left you with a respect that, uh, that makes, maybe makes a definition of leadership. He also one of the greatest memories I have, and it's something you might have had some association with. There was, in a museum in New York City, a handwritten, as I recall, three-page note that was a, a young a student wrote to Governor Reagan and asked him what would, how would he define success in life, if I recall, and he took the time to write a long note explaining what he thought would be a definition of success in life. He was a reflective man. He was a compassionate man and someone who would, who would take time 
to work with a young person and have uh, hand write, take the time to hand, to personally tell the story of what he thought would be a definition of success. Well, I don't think anybody can have it all. I don't think that's a female or a male uh, shortcoming in that uh, you have to make some choices in this world. And you make choices and, um, and then once you, once you set that course, you don't get to go back and, re and re-choose those. Um, I haven't had a family. I raised my younger brothers and sisters, um, but I, I am not biologically a mother. Um, but that was a choice that I made. And I think that one of the benefits we have today is you have the, an opportunity to do choices. And, uh, and I think it's never been better. And let's just hope that um, we, that to face the challenges like we're facing, as we've just were talking about on the international scale or on the biomedical scale or in technology and coding, there is more to be done than ever before. We need the talent of both men and women. And I think that increasingly, the wise money is going to the optimal talent engagement and not necessarily just the male talent engagement. So I think nobody can have it all. I concur that I've had a great life and have no complaints about that. Uh, but I think that still people do make choices and, um, and, you cho and the choices you make early on, and especially at the time like college time, the choices that you make now set a course that will be decisive about many of the future opportunities that you get. The better, op the better education you can get, and the better involvement, the, better, uh, the more uh, learnings that you get in your youth, the, more, the broader the reach will be of what you can do in your ultimate careers and lives. Uh, foreign policy to me is one of the most important things that the administration, that any administration will face. If it's the world against us, we lose. We must make friends around the world. We must be interactive on a global scale. We are the world's biggest exporter. We are dependent upon export markets. We are dependent upon, in this connected world, we are dependent upon the talents of people around the world. And, and we are looked to to provide some leadership in how to make that work. We're seeing an increased balkanization. We're seeing isolationism in trade. Those things are going to increase the cost of our products. It's going to make our, uh, what we as consumers have access to vastly more limited and more expensive. Uh, we're changing the dynamics. Uh, of course, we've just seen a complete swing in uh, gas and oil. As, isolation, as an isolated nation, yes, we're big and yes, we're powerful. But if it's the world against us, we lose. So we need to be interactive. We need to have friends around the world. We need to have respect of global partners. Hillary Clinton wrote a book called, uh, when, when she was first running for president, It Takes a Village, but maybe it takes an immigrant. America has been a welcoming nation. We need to be that. We need to be a welcoming nation, especially uh, for people of talent and people of contribution people that are willing to be creative and imaginative and put, work, uh, put together uh, an idea and a productivity with work. And when we think about it, when we think about all of what's happened in the technology field, I mean, Intel was started by a bunch of 20-somethings, and, and Facebook and Microsoft and Google, and all of these are organizations started by young people who had a talent and had a drive to do something. It's a, we live in an exciting time, and talent is where now prosperity will drift to where the talent is, the applied talent. So we as a country ought to be welcoming of people who want to come here and, be, and design and build.